do my research in Joshua Tree National Park. Um, I'm a little bit tethered here until I get the pointer, so bear with me. So Joshua trees are really hot right now, and I mean that both ecologically and also culturally. Um, you kind of have to be living under a rock if you didn't hear about the trees that got cut down during the government shutdown. Everybody was talking about those trees in Joshua Tree. Um, so those trees got really famous, the two trees that died. Then there's also the really famous Joshua Tree that arguably everybody knows that uh, was on the cover of the U2 album. That Joshua Tree got loved to death, but you can still go visit it, and there's a, there's a whole altar space built for that, that special Joshua Tree. Joshua Trees have been the subject of many, um, in the backgrounds of many music videos and, and Vogue fashion shoots. They're, they're all the rage, it's a place to get married. Um, I don't know if you've seen this Johnny Depp, new Johnny Depp commercial where he's selling Savage perfume in Joshua Tree National Park. He's wearing a lot of eyeliner and he's out there digging in the desert. I don't know what's going on with the video. It's hilarious. You should check it out after this talk. And then also right now, the Department of Fish and Wildlife is actually currently reviewing Joshua Trees to see if it's warranted to give them endangered species protection. And that is because um, it's getting really hot and dry with the changing climate and Joshua Trees um, are, are very threatened and may not make it for too long. It's uh, getting too hot and too dry for the trees in the places they currently live. So um, this, uh, I'll take you into Joshua Tree National Park, so let me see if I can point it all. No, I can't. Okay, so, oh yes, up here at the top is um, Southern California, so this little green area is the National Park, and I blow it out here for you, and this outline is the, the park boundaries of Joshua Tree National Park. Everything in black here is the distribution uh, currently where Joshua Trees live in the National Park. And so if I crank up the heat with some climate modeling to say, you know, what's it going to look like with one degree global warming? Um, that area where the trees live, it starts to shrink. And so with two degrees warming, it gets a little bit smaller. And by three degrees warming, uh, there's very few places we think the trees will be able to live in the National Park. And so at the time this study was done, that was projected to be in about 100 years, a century, we'd see this much warming. And with recent reports, the IPCC, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, suggests it's more like 40 years. It's happening really quickly. So when this study came out, I was just starting my PhD and um, you know, considering what I'm going to do for research. And I'm from Joshua Tree area, so this really hit me hard. And I thought, my oh, God, I have to do something with Joshua Trees. I really want to know what's happening. In the park, um, models are one thing. So I, I wanted to figure out, you know, how are the trees doing in the national park? How are their populations? But Joshua trees also, you know, they don't exist by themselves. They they exist in these entangled um, interspecies relationships. They're really important to Joshua tree survival. So I want to know what's happening with their their multi-species assemblages. So I researched down in the Joshua tree roots is this organism called mycorrhizal fungi. And mycorrhizal fungi are amazing if you've never heard of them. Um, there are these microscopic organisms that exist throughout the soils in these vast webs, in all soils everywhere. And these fungi are really, really good at breaking down soil nutrients and breaking down, um, using acids to digest the, the rocks in the soil and making those nutrients available to plants. And so what happens is the fungus breaks down these nutrients and passes it to the plants in exchange for plant sugars. And plants that grow with these kinds of fungi grow bigger, better, stronger, faster than not having the fungi. Um, we think millions of years ago, the whole reason plants were able to move out of the oceans was because they started forming relationships with mycorrhizal fungi. So these are, and this is all fairly new work um, to look at what's happening with these fungal relationships. So I wanted to know, What's happening with these fungi, and do Joshua trees even form these kinds of fungal relationships? It was unknown at the time. So this image is actually, yes, they do. Um, this is a picture of Joshua tree, uh, Joshua tree plant cells. So this is a plant root cell right here. And this blue stuff filling it is the mycorrhizal fungi. And then it's got this little arm that's reaching out, and that's what goes foraging throughout the soils. And like I said, vast networks throughout the soils. This picture was taken from my mom's backyard uh, from her Joshua tree. And so that's potentially the first Joshua tree fungi picture. So I want to know what's happening with these organisms in climate change. And then I also work up in the canopy of the Joshua trees. So there is a teeny tiny moth pollinator that is the sole pollinator for Joshua trees. Um, this is the only way Joshua trees reproduce, is with this little relationship with a tiny moth about the size of an apple seed. And so she does the most amazing thing. 
She is a purposeful pollinator. This is one of the only examples of purposeful pollination in all of nature. Most pollinators bumble around and by accident they're pollinating things. And this little moth goes and she collects pollen from Joshua tree blossoms and holds them in tentacles right here instead of a mouth. Thank you. Um, holds them in little tentacles instead of a mouth, and then she takes that and purposefully pushes it down into another Joshua tree blossom with her arms. And that's amazing. And then she lays her babies inside of the flower, and what she's doing is ensuring that her developing moth larva now have Joshua tree seeds to eat once they develop. And so her babies eat some of the Joshua tree seeds, and then some of the other seeds go on to become the next generation of Joshua trees. So it's this uh, beautiful symbiotic relationship that's also, um, that I'm interested to know what's gonna happen with the changing climate. So I have field sites across Joshua Tree National Park from the, the warmest, coolest, oh there we go, okay, I can work this. <coughs> warmest, coolest sites down here at the base of the park all the way up to the, I'm sorry, the warmest, driest, the base all the way up to the highest and coolest. Um, I collect data and what I found in my research is that along this climate gradient, Joshua trees are growing really well in some of these intermediary spots. They're dense, they're big, they're, they're happy. Uh, at the low elevations, they're dying. We're, we're losing trees, and there's no new babies. They are not sexually reproducing. Up here at the highest elevations, it's the same thing. There are no little baby Joshua trees, and they're just not very happy. With the moths, there's a similar story. Lots of moths in the middle. There were actually no moths at the hottest and driest or the coolest sites. No moths mean no seeds, no new Joshua tree babies reflected there. So um, what I found in some is that climate change can act both independently on the, uh, on the different organisms, on the moths and the Joshua tree, and it can also impact the relationship between them and the outcomes of their interaction. Um, I have real graphs and data if you want to check it out on my website. Um, and then also National Geographic did a nice cover on this piece um, that explains it. So zooming back down in the roots with the fungi, what's happening with the fungi? So Unfortunately, you can't just look at them under a microscope to see who's there and what they're doing. You have to use some molecular techniques, and so I had to go into the DNA and uh, use those tools to figure out what's happening with the different fungal communities. And what I found is that there are a whole bunch of different fungi in Joshua Tree um, soils. And these 36 different fungal species, um, actually they group together by elevation. So there's the warm elevation fungi, the mid and the high elevation fungi, which is really cool. But what are they doing? Does that even matter to Joshua trees? So I grew Joshua trees with these different fungal communities in the lab, and I found that it actually does matter. These different fungal communities do different things to the trees it's developing, um, based uh, that change depending on the fungal species involved and the amount of time that it happens. And so they can go from parasitic to mutualistic. So this is all really interesting. So to put this all together, what it means is that you know, as the climate changes, these plants are going to need to establish in new locations um, to track the changing climate, and they're going to encounter their partners in these new locations, and the identity of those partners matters, and also the numbers of those partners is going to matter. Um, so with these results, I work with uh, staff at the National Park, rangers, and, and researchers to help figure out what, what it is we're going to, you know, how do we approach these, these big questions, and how do we use this work to think about things like assisted migration, which I can been a long time talking about because that's a whole other complicated topic. Or restoring burned areas. Um, I also work with the Department of Fish and Wildlife while we're considering uh, the endangered species protection of Joshua trees. But, you know, Joshua trees are also embedded in the social cultural system as well. People do not want to lose their Joshua trees. Um, it's a very emotional experience when people start thinking about what's happening with the Joshua trees and Joshua tree systems. So, to me, it's really important to consider how does how can ecological research that's linked to an art practice help inspire and motivate social change? And so this is also some of the work that I do. And I approached this um, through experimental paintings, uh, stop motion animation, and then I created an online dating site where you can meet Joshua Trees. So in my uh, experimental art practice, I really wanted to express some of the immense underground complexity I was seeing in the fungal, the fungal systems, and also to share the microscopic work, the microscope, and to just use this as a way to you know, personally get into some of the complexity, but also to share this with others. So I've, I've gotten to, into an uh, experimental painting practice where I utilize elements from my field sites. And so I actually take Joshua tree seeds and I extract um, oil from the seeds and I use that to mix into my paints. 
Um, I use alcohol and soap, fire and water, and I do all kinds of things to play with the physicality of the planes, the paints, um, and I do that to to get out these these really strange and interesting organic dynamics that start to look like the underground fungal systems that I'm finding in my work. And so this has become quite a science practice. I take lots of notes um, to be able to recreate the desired um, the desired textures and combinations that I'm finding. And what I was able to do is start to create some of these, these lacy uh, fungal networks that I'm finding underground. And so in each of the paintings, my work is very conceptual in that the data is actually coded into the paintings. And so what you're seeing here is elements like the pH of the soils and the, um, the soil nutrient levels are all, all decisions that I use to reflect um, the colors that I'm choosing. Right here, these are symbiotic interactions in my, my painting, and so these speak to the association between the fungi and the plant. And so I tear into the canvas, and I restitch it back together in different patterns that correspond to the different fungal species. And the different numbers of these symbiotic interactions change, and these interactions also speak to the tension of that parasitism, that mutualism um, that's happening within the ecosystem. And so these change along the climate gradient, and so this is another way to kind of understand some of the complexity of the science. And again, you'll see the number of the density of the symbiotic interactions changes and the way that I, I stitch them back together. Um, I also use Joshua Tree spines. You can tease them apart into these really strong tensile um, strings, and I use that to stitch. That's what I'm stitching these canvases back together with. And just to give you an example of how I do some of these painting work, so it's, it's both really... Um, controlled and then there is uh, you know there is some spontaneity in this work also. And I do this back and forth until I arrive at a conclusion on the the canvas that, that feels right. I also layer these pieces too so there is um, things hidden within them that I'll come back through on a canvas later and sand it out. And these go on and on and I pull out different elements so that's what that piece looks like when it's done. So these paintings, um, I show them in their own right, kind of exhibited along a climate gradient. So it's like you would, you would move through the paintings as if you're moving along my field sites. Um, these paintings have also become the backdrops in a stop motion animation that I've created, a Joshua Tree love story. And so this is gonna be released um, April, uh, pretty soon in April. And this, the, the reason I made this stop motion animation is I really wanted to share the story of the research um, in my field sites but I also wanted to connect it to a personal narrative. And so most of the work I did when I was doing my study with Joshua Tree, I was either really pregnant or I had a little baby strapped to my back. And so I thought it was important to share some of that story and to help connect people emotionally to this work. Um, you know, for me, when I was out there in the field, I was really reckoning with what, what we're leaving, what you know, legacy I'm leaving for my son. I mean, 100 years, the trees are all gonna be gone. That's his lifetime. And so that, that was all woven into this story. <coughs> And I'll just show you a quick sneak peek of the um, trailer. You can go onto my website and watch this. It's set to an emotional cello score. I didn't want to uh, do like a science narration because I really wanted people to be able to connect with the work um, in their own way as well. Um, and so in this, I created large puppets that I was able to animate. So you get to see the yucca moth pollinating the, the Joshua tree blossoms, as I was describing, because they're so teeny tiny, so that was really fun. And then I also created all these little little uh, hand-painted faces that really give the nuances of emotion and expression, again, like helping people to connect with the characters in the story throughout the animation. Um, I used natural history museum style inspired backdrops and sets to reference that legacy of um, science outreach. And um, in some early showings that I've done of this work, people reported that that being able to experience the science in this way really helped them connect to it on a different emotional level than just hearing the science talk alone. And so um, that alongside with some other um, findings I, I published in this paper if you'd like to learn more about it. So after doing all of this work, um, you know, and, and interacting with the public in different ways, I really wanted to now take another art project that was a little more participatory and um, collaborative with the work I was doing. And so I ended up creating, and also in response to the trees that got cut down and the uh, 
just the public outcry around that, I ended up creating this, this uh, online dating site where you can meet Joshua Trees from my field sites. And so this is an, a collaboration that's ongoing with about 50 different artists and musicians and the public. And you can go to my website, ajtree.com, and you can pick a charismatic tree from my field sites. There's about 16 of them on there. And you can go and, and choose your tree and, and check it out. And there's ecological data. And there's a scavenger hunt, so you can actually make a pilgrimage to your tree. Um, each tree has, has a little anthropomorphized profile, like a dating profile written for it by guest writers. Um, there's a music video for each tree by different collaborating musicians. Actually, one of the musicians is here tonight. If I knew he was going to be here, I would have shown it. Anyways, it's, it's been a really fun project, and as the public, you can, you can engage by sending your tree a love letter. And so each love letter gets uploaded uh, on the website, so each tree builds a following in this way. Um, and it, I've got quite a number of collaborators. People also come out to the field and help me collect data. Um, and I also work with kids on this project in this sense. It's not a dating site as much as a pen pal site when I share it with children and I'll take them out to the field and they get to pick their favorite tree and I show them techniques for drawing them and then we create stencils and make Joshua tree forests and they make names and little uh, profile descriptions. I show this work at music festivals and I've also worked with artists to create um, cutouts of each of the Joshua tree silhouettes to make like woodblock prints. And so when I go to festivals, um, I'll work with people to make silhouette prints of the trees. And so they can take their tree home and they can look it up online and, and, and engage and interact with their tree. So this is all linked to you know, social media and Instagram and things like that. And it's, it's one of the ways uh, I also co-opt the tools that so often divide us from our environment. Um, you know, it's a little tongue-in-cheek. Like if I have to get you to pay attention by making a dating site, I'll do it fine. Um, so this is, and then it also provides a way for lots of people to engage and interact, and it's been really fun so far. So if you'd like to play, go to heyjtree.com. You can also check out the, you know, follow the work at heyjtree, and if you have a favorite tree, please share it um, with the hashtag heyjtree, and I'm building a Joshua Tree uh, following this way too, so I get to see other people's favorite trees. So, you know, Joshua trees are really impacted by the changing climate and we're losing them and it's really sad, but this is just one of the many species that, are, that we're losing every day. Uh, we're in the midst of the sixth major extinction event on our planet. Uh, it's pretty overwhelming and real. Um, so I just think at this point we need some really radical decisions to be made that value environment, equity, and diversity. And I think that when brought together, art and science have a really powerful way to help inspire people to embrace some of the sustainable changes that we need to see in our futures. So thank you.